Okay, everybody, I'd like to welcome you to our uh, New Music Alliance Music Licensing Workshop. And thank you so much for coming. And uh, we, uh, sorry, we got started in a little bit of a hectic thing. They kind of double booked this room. Uh, so, but the group that was here was poetry, reading poetry. They were very nice. <laughs> and they actually uh, moved up to the uh, lounge upstairs to finish their session. They thought they were supposed to be here until 3 30, so anyway, they told me they were going to be gone at 3. But anyway, here we are. And uh, again, we're going to have a, a great uh, session today. We've got some great people here. and. Uh, I want to introduce our panel now. But first, I wanted to say, if you haven't signed in yet, um, please do that at the door. There's also little stickers, little Music Alliance stickers. Feel free to take one uh, or two. <laughs> and um, also, uh, there were some forums out there. And obviously, everything's online, too. But um, if you haven't already become a member of the New Music Alliance, please consider doing that become a member for as little as $12, and uh, certainly a, a more than that if you feel generous. So uh, in any case, uh, we'll start our workshop out by first introducing our panel. First of all, I'm Mark Sherry. I'm the uh, Executive Director of the New Music Alliance. And over here we have Will Bangs. And Will, would you uh, tell everybody just a little bit about yourself? Sure, yeah. So um, I'm based in the area. I used to live in Northampton, now live in Belchertown. Um, and I run mostly the business side of um, a music licensing agency called Music Box Licensing. Um, I started off, I, mean, I played in bands growing up and toured, and, uh, but my heart was always with composing. Um, and long story short, uh, you know, I went from sort of like scoring indie, fi indie films and um, some web content and stuff uh, to then sort of like move on to helping other musicians um, and partnering with labels to get their music placed or get them good composing gigs. Um, and my work is mostly in the advertising realm. Um, I could speak more about sort of the pros and cons of that. But um, yeah, I'm sort of a musician at heart and that's how I got into this, but um, really enjoy sort of being a, um, a connecting point between independent musicians and small labels and um, advertising agencies and brands. Great, thank you. Uh, my name is Alan Day. Uh, I'm also kind of based kind of in the area, I guess, uh, a little bit closer to Worcester, kind of in between here and Worcester. Um, I'm a, I guess, kind of lifelong musician, professionally for the past kind of 15 years or so. I play mostly in a band. Um, I do a lot of touring around the world, a lot of recording, all kinds of stuff. Um, but in the past handful of years, I've been kind of trying to pivot, or I guess not pivot, but find other avenues of income, because I'm sure mostly everyone in here is probably a musician and knows that there's not a lot of money in it. Um, especially these days. So I figured, look into, um, I, I run a recording studio, so I work with a lot of bands writing and recording and mixing music. And I also, because I have a studio, um, I'm able to compose and spend a lot of time making a lot of my own music outside of my band. And that's kind of where that led to finding ways to make money off of that music. I would be writing for myself, in placing it in ads or short films, indie films, things like that. Um, and I'm still relatively new to it, and I figured that might be of maybe some valuable insight because I, I still <coughs> could learn a lot about how to maximize efficiency in the licensing world, but I could speak for my experience as well. Okay. What's the band? Uh, it's called Four Years Strong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. John? Uh, thanks, Mark, for inviting me uh, to be part. Um, I'm kind of relatively new in the area, and I know I know that's true because even though uh, my wife and I have lived here for six years now, I still 
don't know so many people. <laughs> and somebody says, what? You don't know something? You don't know Greg? Oh, he's, got a, he's got a studio. Where is it? It's like right beneath your apartment. <laughs> oh. Anyway, um, I uh, moved here uh, six years ago from the Washington, D.C. area. I'm a musician, um, songwriter, uh, composer, uh, producer, arranger guy. And um, at this point uh, in my life, I, I think if there's one thing I could probably uh, testify to is the reality that my own life uh, has shown me uh, that you, in order to make a living in music, you have to really diversify and be able to um, do a lot of different things. Um, and I, I love seeing that folks are starting these services, companies, collaboratives um, to uh, shore up the uh, community because um, <clears throat> when I first started playing music uh, in uh, DC, uh, I was uh, started playing in bands really young and then uh, first bands I was in down south and moved to DC and played in bands. Started so, uh, writing songs and playing with different people, uh, a lot of clubs in D.C. and, and bigger shows in D.C. Uh, this was in the late 70s. And um, actually, early 70s. And then mid-70s, um, some of the folks with whom I was friends and who we were, uh, with whom I was performing, doing harmonies for, co-writing with, they wanted to start uh, a new band. Where's Donna? There's this Donna. We were talking about this, uh, the whole keeping, keeping track of who, you know, who's, oh, is such and such uh, still playing with such and such and such, and, you know, and it's whatever, whatever a scene is um, in those days, I think was simpler because um, there wasn't social media. Uh, so there, in that way, that, that, that virtual cartilage was, was, wasn't there at that time, but it was, it was a telephone and, uh, and newspapers and going downtown and seeing where your friends were playing and, and uh, that. And this one fellow uh, had written a song that was successful and he, he and his wife wanted to do another show, uh, another group actually, he wanted to do another record. They owed their record company two, two sides, two songs. And uh, they wanted to try out this uh, idea of a vocal group. And since I had sung with them and played with them, and they knew another gal that was in another group that they were involved in, and uh, we tried out this idea of doing a vocal group. And that became uh, Starland Vocal Band. And uh, the next year, we, we did our first of four records. It was our only big hit, but it was a really big hit called Afternoon Delight. And um, so the interesting part of, uh, of that history for me was that uh, it was really big. It didn't feel like a destination at all for me. It did with the other guys in the group who were all 10 years older than I was. But it felt very much like a, a validating start uh, to, to something. Uh, we won Grammys and, and this, that, and the other thing. Um, then the the group broke up, and we uh, we were, I was married to the other gal in the group. We kind of became a two couple group because how can you not really <laughs> if you like each other? It's like yeah, hey, okay, save on hotels, <laughs> and um, so we. Uh, Right after we got married we ha and we had a baby, uh, the record co company went belly up. And at that point, I had to uh, prevail upon uh, whatever I could do uh, 
by hook or by crook. I'm kind of, my life has been sort of like, <coughs> like a cartoon, like olive oil. She's blindfolded, she's walking there asleep, and she's walking with the girders <laughs> up in the sky. She doesn't know where she is. But her foot comes down to other girders along the way. That's kind of been what my career has, has been. Um, because being a songwriter and a musician, I, I like to, I, I think I'm a good, I have proven to various ways of being a good person to play with another songwriter because I'm a song guy. And um, so that world kind of opened up. We did uh, jingles in the, in the 80s. That was the first thing that kind of opened up that was like, really, can we make money doing this? Yeah, and we can, this guy came through and so wanted to have to move, yeah, sorry. move anyway, on a little bit. Okay. So <laughs> diversify is kind of what I've done, and, and the licensing is sort of uh, worked in that way as well. Okay, okay great, thanks. Move me along. <laughs> we hope we have a short, only short time. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we have one panelist who is not here today, and uh, that's Stephen Schoenberg. And he uh, just called me this morning. He sounds horrible. He's got acute bronchitis, and uh, if there was, he said he would have come anyway, except the doctor said that he, he's close to pneumonia. So I don't think it would have been a good idea for him to be here for for him for him and for us. So uh, in any case. Uh, he was very, very sorry that he couldn't be here. So, um, but in any case, we will start um, our discussion now. And um, so, I guess the first thing that we have on our uh, our agenda here is is how to build a portfolio and uh, how to represent yourself and uh, and your work. And uh, well, would you uh, maybe have something to take the lead on that? Sure. Um, I mean, I guess there are a few different ways to think about this. If you are, um, like, you know, composing music specifically for placements in TV shows or ads or whatever, I feel like I can speak a lot to that. Um, how, how many folks in here, just out of curiosity, like, um, have, have done that or are interested in doing that, like writing specifically for, for media? Okay, cool. So maybe you already have this, maybe you don't, but as far as you know, my perspective goes, um, a couple of things are really helpful. Um, you know, number one, you know, know your strengths and what your unique sound is that you bring to the table. Um, for me, for example, I, I was really good and the kind of music I made before even writing for films and stuff was um, sort of in the ambient neoclassical realm, um, really influenced by people like Max Richter and um, bands like Sigur Rós and things like that. And I felt like that was my, my niche. Um, <clears throat> and I actually, it's kind of why I moved into representing other people's stuff because I inevitably started working with these filmmakers, producers who then started asking me for things like totally outside of my like comfort zone. Like they asked me for like hip hop and I'd be like, well, I could do it, but it's gonna sound like contrived. And I know somebody does hip hop and they're way better at it. So, you know, if you are sort of in like my camp where you, like you've got one sound you do you know like that you do really really well um, you know having you know your own website with uh, you know like streaming links to your stuff um, there are a few like platforms that are kind of like industry standards for the licensing world um, and I've got cards you can email me about any of this stuff I can send you links um, I was going to show it on the screen but the projectors um, not really working um, there's a, a platform called disco um, which is really like music supervisors um, and producers and folks at ad agencies. It's really user friendly. It's not too expensive. I pay like 10 bucks a month. Um, and it's like really good for pitching playlists to people. Um, you know, I, I mentioned, you know, start having a website with, um, you know, streamable music and, um, you know, examples of your work, you know, especially like if you have any, like anything that matches well with with um, video. When I was first starting off, I, I offered, just because I was <coughs> excited about collaborating with filmmakers, I offered to do a lot of stuff pro bono, um, which is obviously like really enticing to a lot of people. So um, that's one way to get your foot in the door, just to have some like, you know, I think people really like to be able to see it to picture and not just like as a music track sometimes. So it, the way I found some people to sort of build my portfolio in the beginning was, um, 
actually I used Kickstarter a lot and found like really cool indie films that, you know, they have a whole like film section. So I found like really cool indie films that really spoke to me. And, you know, they're in this sort of pre-production phase and most of them haven't really thought about like who's our composer going to be. So it's actually like a really nice time to sort of get your foot in the door with people. So I'd offer to do stuff pro bono for them. I also went on Vimeo a lot um, just because I feel like it's like higher quality standard of like filmmaking than traditionally a lot of stuff you find on YouTube. And so I found filmmakers, you know, if you like the Vimeo staff picks. Um, and some of them were commercial and some of them were more sort of like their creative, um, you know, they were like short films or um, like, you know, whatever, uh, animations. And so that's a really nice way, I think, to start to build a portfolio and also start to build a relationship with people. Uh, now, I'm totally not advocating, you know, like doing work for free often, but I think there's a place for it, especially in the beginning when you want to sort of build a portfolio, start building relationships. Um, oftentimes, for me at least, um, those relationships led to work later on down the road, either with those same film producers or, you know, they would, um, you know, provide really great testimonials that I could share on my website or they would connect me, they would feel like they owed me a favor, so they would put in a good word for me with their um, production uh, folks. Um, so that's one thing. If you're in sort of the uh, another camp of, um, I don't think he's here right now, but um, somebody I've worked with a lot in the past, a local musician and composer, Paul Amos, he um, is like a, a real gem of a composer who can really, is like kind of a jack of all trades. He can, he can write, I was telling Alan earlier, he can write, um, every, he's done like horror trailer music for me that's like really scary and crazy sound design stuff to like light, happy, classical stuff. And um, it could be as simple as um, like what he shares with me. He's got like thousands of tracks that he shared with me. And it's just a Google Drive folder. Each folder is like, all right, here's my retro synth stuff. Here's my acoustic stuff. Here's my horror trailer stuff. And just sharing that with me, he can share with music supervisors, having stuff organized, um, especially if you're pitching to music supervisors or people at agencies, um, you know, they're often short on time and they're, they're sifting through, especially if they're looking for a pre-recorded track, they want to find something quickly and easily. So having, if you write in a lot of different styles, having it well organized, anything from as simple as a Google Drive folders to Disco, which is like good for pitching um, one-off projects, to um, having, um, and I know there's like free and cheap ways to do it that are really well done. Um, uh, there are two composers, I'm thinking of one, Dan Koch, K-O-C-H, I think his website is Dan, C-O-K-E though, dot com, and then Keith Kenneth, um, who does a lot of work for Apple and things like that. And they have these cool like sound, somehow like SoundCloud players, um, and I could tell you more if you're interested in it, where it has like a tab, it's like, here's all my classical stuff, here's all my happy stuff, here's all my sad stuff, so a producer or somebody can quickly go through it. The last thing I'll say as far as building a portfolio, once you start to really amass a lot of tracks, like say somebody like Paul, um, uh, and this can sometimes be the work of the agency if you work with an agency. Right now I'm just kind of talking about like representing yourself, doing a DIY. But um, once, you've rep once you've amassed a lot of tracks, like somebody like Paul, um, it's really helpful. And, um, and Jackson in the back knows this. He was worked with me this summer. He did a lot of this for me, um, is tagging each individual track. So, you know, you have a, say, a folder of 20 um, acoustic tracks, but for somebody who's like short on time, um, or things like in the ad world, I, I can speak to move at a really fast clip, um, having each track tagged with a couple descriptor words. So, like, usually I keep it to like three words, and it's like the emotion, the genre, and maybe like the tempo or something. So, I can quickly see, like, I need a fast acoustic track, I need a really happy one, I need a really sad one, so I can quickly go through it. Those little things um, make a pretty big difference, because um, your tracks might be really, really good, but if they're not well organized or easily sort of shareable and presented, um, people might not um, might not hear that gem of a track. So I hope that kind of answers the question a little bit. When, when you mention, when you say tracks, okay, uh, you're obviously in my estimation, not always talking necessarily about a full song. Yeah, I was mostly speaking to the folks who had their hands up about like composing specifically for media. For stuff with, you know, if it's a full song, um, I mean, generally, at least from my perspective, um, you know, it doesn't have to be that sort of 
tightly organized. Like I know I can go to Alan, Alan and I have worked together, I know I can go to Alan for like really kick ass like pop punk stuff. You know, and like he knows his catalog way better than I do, so I ask him for a track and you know, with the specific specs, mood, genre, whatever the creative brief calls for, and he'll send me stuff. Um, or, you know, you're with, um, and I certainly have plenty of relationships like that where I'm working directly with an independent artist, but, um, you know, I also work a lot with labels who, you know, will, will do that same sort of thing. So they, you know, they know their catalog well, and I know, like, if I really want to get, like, kick ass, like, folk Americana stuff, I'll go to Signature Sounds, you know, um, and I'll talk to folks there. So it doesn't have to be so tightly um, sort of packaged and tagged like that if you're like a, a songwriter or a band who's looking for placements, because um, I think you'll probably have your sound pretty well identified, and I'll, um, you know, and then I can go to whoever it is, the artist or the label, or if I really know them, then I can just search through it myself. But um, I think all the regular sort of channels for you know, band camp and, you know, uh, however you present your band, you know, on the web um, works, works fine too. Okay. And then if you partner up with the label, if you're like a band and you partner, sorry, not with the label, if you partner up with a music agency, um, you know, they'll do a lot of that sort of like cataloging for you um, where they'll make it easily searchable for their clients. Um, so you don't really have to worry about that. Great, thanks. Alan, actually, before you, you uh, add something, I always want to, Jackson, could you stand up, please? Sure. That's Jackson Williams, and I want to thank Jackson. He helped set up this workshop for us. And he did work with Will, uh, how long did you work with? Uh, it was about a summer, a couple months. Yeah, and he was very, very helpful. So thank you so much. Yep. For thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess on the portfolio, portfolio building, um, again, I can speak on the insight of kind of kicking that off, because I'm kind of still doing that. I think it's something you can infinitely be doing, right, is building a portfolio. Um, and one of the things I struggled with getting started, which I'm sure everyone here, if you're in the very beginnings of wanting to license your music, um, is how do you build a portfolio and a website of, of your examples of your work when you don't have work? Um, and I definitely struggle with that because um, I, I do have the advantage of being known as a musician publicly, um, so I can reach out to someone that there's a chance they might be familiar with some of my work but they'll assume that my work is in that small box that I live in creatively and professionally in my band. But I personally think I'm capable of a lot more than just that one little thing, and I have a, a lot of fun writing all different kinds of music. So how do I build a portfolio that lets someone know I can do a, a classical arrangement of you know, something that's really synced to a video or, um, or a, an ambient kind of weird thing that's spooky for a horror movie, like, I feel that I am capable of that, so what's the best way to show people that? And from my experience so far, it's been, like, I guess just don't underestimate the power of networking and reaching out to people, kind of like Will was saying, um, there's what I like to call like the cold call version, where you go on Vimeo or Kickstarter, which that's a good idea. I haven't done that, um, uh, but I, I have done that because I also am a producer working with artists, kind of not in the licensing world. And I've done that where I'll go on Bandcamp and find localish bands and find something that I truly like, and we'll reach out to them and say, "Hey, I would love to work with you." Um, but I found that that doesn't always lead places for me because I fear, as an artist myself, of the person I'm reaching out to feeling like it's a cold call, you know, because not everyone appreciates, like, you know, I get probably six to ten phone calls a day now from some telemarketer, and it's, you know, I don't like it. But anyway, um, so basically what I did 
in my networking was, um, again, I've had the advantage of being a professional musician for a while now. I've made a lot of music videos, met a lot of people, met a lot of directors that make small films that are just kind of involved in the video world. So one of the first things I did was I reached out to people that I knew that had interest in or, or had a career in, in, um, in the video world. And I asked for just video that they've taken. Like, do you have any cool shots that you're not using for anything, B-roll stuff that you've compiled um, that you can send that I, even I could edit together and just like create something on top of to put on my website. Um, so I did a lot of that. I luckily got a lot of great responses from people I knew, people I didn't know. Um, and I've also heard, I, I haven't actually done this, but I've heard of people also just going on YouTube and like, you know, ripping some video from like, there are movies out there that don't have a lot of like score to it. Like I think, what are the movies? Um, I don't remember the movies. Can I, can I just add on one thing yeah, you were yeah. saying? So I, I know you said like you didn't, uh, and we've talked about this before, like where do you start the portfolio? Um, and I know you said like you don't really feel like you have like a, you're still in the very early stages. Um, but I think you do have a really good portfolio. It just might not be like, you might not be thinking about it in terms of licensing. Right. But you know, you've got a, uh, obviously your band's website, mm -hmm. right? And then you've got, um, your personal site is mostly the bands that you produce, and how, how many people in here produce other people's music? Okay, cool. So actually some of the most helpful people I work with, um, in addition to labels and, and independent artists, are producers. Um, and I know so, some people who make almost sort of a full-time income, sort of both producing other people's music and then helping them package it for licensing. So. I think there have been a few projects where I've reached out to you about some of the bands that you've right, produced, yeah. yep. like, and you know that catalog really well. You have the relationship with the bands, I don't, and so I can reach out to you. And you know, if the, like when that project finishes, like it's obviously like we all share in the, you know, in the in the outcome of it, and you get a cut of it and everything. So I would also just encourage you for folks who produce other people's music um, to think about, you know. Uh, maybe it's like when you're in the studio with them or maybe you have a back catalog of stuff where you can reach out to them but um, you know I, like I said I'm, I can talk mostly from like the advertising world but um, you know thinking of talking with them like hey would you be interested in licensing your music um, and if so like let's think about how we can make uh, like a 30 second cut down version a 60 second cut down version because um, those are usually the time frames you're working with on, on TV or a 15 second cut down version obviously having instrumental versions and stems of things. That's often things that you know I get asked for by producers is they need instrumental versions of things, but they also often need um, stems to the individual tracks that they can mix or take parts out or whatever. But um, you, know, you can kind of act as like a, another sort of connecting point between the artist and uh, maybe the producers themselves or the artist and like somebody like me, an agency and then the final placement. And I've, I've had lots of really successful, so I know you don't really feel like it's a portfolio, but you, your right. site, you've got like all these bands you produced. And when I got a brief, you know, that was like asking for like something like pretty, like in the rock uh, territory. Uh, rock yeah. territory, I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll call Alan, he knows this. I'm not gonna spend my time going through all this stuff when he already knows it. And I'm also not gonna cold call when he has a relationship with these bands. Right. And so he's gonna help me figure out, find that needle in the haystack, and then you know he's gonna get a cut of it, because he obviously did a lot of work. Yeah, and I have, I have, I got that advice from you. Yeah. When we first started working together. And since then, every artist that I work with, um, and I've worked with artists kind of all around the, the world, I do bring up like, hey, by the way, there's money to be made in advertising. And it, placing your music so just keep that in mind and I'll try and shop it when I can um, as long as everyone's open to that because again I would have to I would have to work do an extra work as the producer or mix mix engineer um, to once we finish a track to 
print stems of everything and to print an instrumental and to print a vocal only um, so that I have all those pieces that if someone were to reach out, like you said, timing is everything in the industry and if you don't have something ready to go right then and there, then you might miss up the opportunity just off of that. Um, so yeah, I have, I have applied that advice. <laughs> Good. Great. Okay. I've seen a couple hands. I'm just, I'm just curious. Uh, so can you mention like some of, some of the ads that you put music into and what you make for that sort of thing or, or and what the, and like what the deal is or something? I mean, I'm just yeah, yeah, totally, totally. And I was I was gonna show a few work samples like show not just like tell you guys. I was gonna show some yeah. Alan stuff and some of Paul stuff um, who I was talking about earlier lives in East Hampton, but. We didn't have speakers, so yeah, I'm happy to tell you. The range is all over the place. Yeah, make. yeah. I mean, I, I worked on like, it sounds so random. When I say it out loud. Chilean, um, tele the largest Chilean telecom company, um, WAM, and um, they, you know, they commissioned us to um, to do a hard rock cover of "Come Together" by the Beatles for this like big ad campaign that they did. Um, just this weekend, I was I'm working on. Um, Placing, it's a really like music driven spot. Um, so like it's the storytelling's all with the vocals um, for st uh, Stars, the network for a Black History Month special um, promo that they're doing. Um, done a bunch of work with uh, ad agencies based in New York City and Boston. So I travel down and meet with people there and do presentations and all that good stuff. Um, our bread and butter has been in the advertising world working with um, brands like LinkedIn, Google, um, LinkedIn's, some of it's direct to the client. So like LinkedIn has an in-house um, ad agency. Um, and other people like Google, they have like, these vendors, these ad agencies that we go through. Um, and I'd say if, especially if you're doing it yourself, but even if you're working with a music agency like me, um, I, you're gonna have a whole lot less headache if you go direct to a brand um, because it's just that many less people, less people involved. You know, um, your rates of like finishing are much higher if you go to an in-house agency. Um, you know, it's like playing a game of telephone. Things get lost and um, there's so many cooks in the kitchen, but that's kind of besides the point, that's another thing. But um, yeah, and so the basic deal, and this is like pretty, pretty standard, there's certainly variants to this, but it's a 50-50 split with the artist um, of the upfront fee. Um, and uh, it's non-exclusive, so people can shop their music around wherever they like. Well, sometimes it can be exclusive, right? For a while. Well, if, if the client specifically asks for it, but my deal with um, with but, artists is not exclusive. But some music houses are exclusive. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. I'm just saying for me, me specifically. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, there are lots of music houses that are exclusive. I, we're not exclusive. Um, so it's just, and it can be as simple as like, here's my music, you know, pitch it, you know, and hopefully we land something. It's basically passive income. Um, to something more involved where people like Alan are like doing something custom from the ground up. Um, so it's a 50-50 split. Um, budgets, I mean, range. I've worked on everything from uh, pro bono up to $100,000 deals. Um, and most of the ad work um, is like an upfront fee. So that's not really, I've only worked on a handful of projects where there's been significant residuals or royalties. Um, and it's interesting, especially for people who are in bands, um, it tends to be um, vocally driven uh, spots, you know, where the music's front and center, as opposed to like background music, where you can earn significant royalties because there are a lot of ad agencies where that's actually under SAG-AFTRA, Screen Actors Guild, and the vocals are considered like a, a voiceover almost. So you can get, um, Anyway, so if there are royalties involved, I don't touch them. It goes in entirely to the artist. Um, and so, like I was saying, we, we, our bread and butter is, is in sort of ads, and that ranges from like TV spots to long form web content, uh, content marketing, um, to like right now we're working with, um, I'm working with, I'm really excited because it's something I've been working on for a long time. You know, the, um, uh, uh, they do a lot of things, but mostly like kitchen sinks and baths and stuff like that. Kohler, um, they want to. They're working with us on a developing a Sonic logo or a Sonic brand, so something that can play, you know, like, kind of like McDonald's da 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 da, like something that can be an earworm, you know, a visual uh, a Sonic identity, and also creating some. Um, There's more of them out there than you might think. Yeah, yeah. there are. Yeah, so. 
we, we do that as well. That's like a new territory for us, but people are really getting into that. Um, and then last thing I'll say um, is my big sort of passion the past year or so has been um, still in the advertising world, but in um, uh, music for trailers. Um, partly from a business perspective, there's like a shit ton of money to be made there, like insane amount of money, like two hundred fifty thousand dollars for a track for a for a um, you know for a teaser trailer for a major blockbuster, um, and uh, it's also really creatively exciting because certainly you know there's like you know like a lot of ads are as you would imagine like it's very like lighthearted, happy, upbeat. Um, when you get in the trailer world, you can get like really weird and dark really fast. So <laughs> that's like, I feel like it opens the door creatively to like different artists that I can work with, but it's also just refreshing. Um, so we've been, I've been working hard to develop sort of like a back catalog because writing music, and I'm happy to talk about this more later, is like writing music for, for brands and ads is very different from writing music for trailers, not just stylistically, but also in terms of the structure of the piece. There's sort of like a formula that you follow for a two and a half minute teaser trailer, which is very different from what you would do for like a two and a half minute branded content. Um, so that's been sort of my passion, both you know in like getting the best work for artists, but also in uh, just creatively like not just doing like upbeat ad music all the time. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, I was. Uh, I, that was very. I heard a while ago. Oh, you you, you get fifty percent. And I didn't, and I realized uh, years afterwards, I didn't know 50% of what, and it seems right. like what you're saying is that yeah, I was, I was gonna 50% chime in. of the fee, yeah. and that doesn't include royalties? Is that, or is that just particular? So, it did, the industry's trending towards uh, buyouts and uh, work for hires. Right. So it's just the upfront fee. Yeah. Um, and for the ad world, that's great because they tend to be really good. Yeah. Um, for the opposite side of things, if um, you wanted to, if you're placing music in a TV show, there's little to no upfront free generally. In my experience, if you're doing production music, it's all the back end royalties and residuals, but that takes a long time sometimes to like go through the PROs and like get to you, and you have to kind of amass a lot of tracks to be able to like make an income off of. Unless you have vocals. And if you, if you can land something with a vocal, then there's a whole different yeah, and I'm not. I'm not really like. I'm not in the TV like placing stuff in TV shows or anything like that. But yeah, fifty fifty is pretty is pretty standard. Is that even true on a, on advertisements? Like, if someone wants an advertisement and wants somebody like singing on it, is that that isn't in the same category? Or is it as far as like the splits uh, and, and the uh, royalties, like because it's like considered an actor. Yeah, so two things to it. Like one, I've placed stuff, um, like we just did something for Bank of America recently where I partnered with a record label. And because um, they needed a hip hop piece, I work with this like, kick ass hip hop record label. And um, in that case, when there's like a third party involved, like there's the artist, there's the label, and then there's me, um, I do a 25 75 split generally. There's always exceptions to the rule, but I don't take more than that. Um, and so that's so that, you know, my, my, big thing is always and sort of what I think makes us a little different from other music houses is and actually I forgot to mention one of the reasons why I started a music house is because I worked for other music agencies and felt like I was treated like crap you know so I was like there's got to be a better way to do this right there's got to be a more artist friendly way because I'm nothing without great talent so for something like that it's the the idea is to like maintain the 50 percent always maintain 50 percent for the artists right and then the label will take the publishing you know side of things and I would take sort of the the placement, um, uh, things with that. Um, and, and the stuff with vocals, it's not always, um, there are not always royalties involved. So it depends if an ad agency is a signatory of SAG-AFTRA. Um, so if they are, they're required to, or if they're a signatory with AFM, American Federation of Musicians. But it's really SAG that gets like the biggest piece of the pie. So this, we worked on a, a spot for a leave. There was this indie band from Wisconsin, and um, and uh, the, there's like basically no voiceover, you know, or anything. It's just this song that tells the story, and um, the ad agency Energy BBDO um, is a signatory of SAG-AFTRA and the AFM, and so they're required to pay these residuals, which were um, 
you know, I'll just give you hard numbers like that. That spot was, I think the fee was like $30,000 total and for like to run for like a year. And then the, so I split that half and half with the artist. Um, but then he earned probably like $45,000 in residuals just because his vocals. Because he wrote, Cause he, cause he wrote it and he's considered a screen actor. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Because if I might add something. Okay. <laughs> I was going to come to you next. <laughs> um, no, because uh, we've been talking about, about 12 different things, and it's all great. And um, But uh, the two, as I, and I'm just right on the tail end of figuring this out, but the song that existed first, and it's a, it's, a, it's a song that you wrote, and then there's the master that is recorded, and, and whoever, I don't know, how various bands deal with who owns the master and has the rights of the master, and how that you probably leave that up to the the band itself Typically, to I guess split it's up their fifty percent yeah, among however my their deal is. The label will own like yeah the master recording is, right they pay for it right, right? but the right. song is owned by the artist as exactly but the writer right yeah because um, that's two different. Entities is the, the actual recording and then the the ownership of the, the song itself, which is worth mentioning that the song is a lot of a lot of times the song is written first and the big elephant in the room uh, that, that goes that I should iterate is that these days record recording money and and broadcast performance royalty, which is terrestrial radio, never was paid in this country, ever. But um, your uh, the brass ring of making money with your music or a song isn't so much airplay anymore. Streaming is the airplay. Streaming pays shit. Um, and now licensing is the way to make Money. That is kind of the new having a hit. Honestly, yeah. The, you well, know, are you endless. talking about like placement in shows or movies as anything, or, or anything, ads? Anything that's like a, a music, uh, a piece of music that someone wants to license for mm -hmm. any sort of usage. For instance, if you yeah. write like for that already is in existence. I write a song. It goes on Spotify. Right. I'm not seeing any money from that. People could listen to it all day, and I rarely. I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't even tell. I don't know if I've ever seen any money from Spotify. Um, and I think our top song on Spotify has, uh, like, I think close to 20 million plays right. or something. Um, and so that but is. But we do yeah. get royalties quarterly mm -hmm. because our song gets played during the Red Sox, like parade footage on ESPN or something like that. And that's and that, where we see all the money. Exactly. And that's a separate license that we're bro that broadcaster right. pays to, mm -hmm. whether it's a, a, a grand license that's divvied up among all of the pe works that were played or an upfront agreed, agreed to license. I have a song in the Linda Ronstadt documentary right now. I'm going to make performance royalties on that the more it's played on CNN or in the theaters, it was in the theaters for a while. But that initial deal was through the publisher, which is BMG, for this particular song. So they they cut that deal. And those types of deals also are a little, a little different because it's F MFN, Most Favored Nation, yeah. which is basically Whoever made the first bid that said you can use our song for this amount of money, whatever the highest bid is, what everybody gets, uh, and and to get that song on the the cue sheet, which is uh, basically what any studio or production company pays for for a, a work like that. Um, all of this is is great. There's there's works for hire. There's assignment writing. is is great. Uh, wonderful things that you can can do in these days you, you know we can do it 
all because we have studios that can generate anything that your creativity can compel it to do. Um, but uh, anyone who's a songwriter or a composer, it's wonderful. As a composer, uh, I have a great time composing to any sort of assignment. It's a, it's, it's a challenge and it's that in and of itself is a piece of work that the creative process is wonderful. Um, and after a while, you turn around and you have a catalog, you have you know a, a portfolio that you can uh, organize and pitch. There are, um, anyway, I would say have your creativity come first, <laughs> you know, whatever it is that's, that's, that you feel like creating first off, that's making your heart sing in the, in the first place. Um, it's very, very hard to sort of negotiate all, all these different uh, aspects of it. Uh, really important to be aware of them all, that's for sure. And especially once you have a bunch of uh, works together that you can uh, do stems of uh, and, uh, for whatever uh, that, you know, it's, a, it's a very thin line between someone licensing a song and someone taking taking a, a song and then making it into a jingle and that's into a jingle or a, an accompanying synced piece of music that is going to be 60 seconds long instead of three and a half minutes long or, or, or you know 30 seconds with a donut you know which is a jingle term where the announcing comes so the trailer uh, thing is, is very interesting though because that that, that was a, a real elucidating aspect of uh, the movie business that there was actually one, for a long time there was just one production house in New York that did trailers for, for movies. I'm sure there's many more now. But that was the first time I realized that the studio that made the movie had nothing to do with the trailer. Nor does uh, the, co the composer for the movie. Yeah, yeah the music is entirely music different. The trailer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's really exciting. And, and if, you, if, you, if that is something that really you're psyched about, you know, composing two things. There's there's montages in, in movies that you you know just if you want to do a demo for you know if you have time to, to do that sort of thing, uh, you know you can do that. Uh, take take an existing piece of film or something and put. Uh, you know, it would probably come after you, but it would certainly show show others what you're capable of, of doing. You know. Yeah, Alan, your, your suggestion of reaching out to people you know to try and get them to uh, yeah, send video and Yeah, even if it's someone mm -hmm. that doesn't have all yeah, that much out there. Uh, well, that's a great if idea. If it's someone that's on the same level as you, but instead of music, they're in, <clears throat> interested in film, right. if you work together, there's no reason you can't both get something out of it. I, don't, I know I'm probably going to contradict myself a little bit, because um, I was saying like people like to see your stuff to video, but... Um, I would also say that you can do it both for the ad work and you know whether it's for a TV spot, like for for a brand is what I'm trying to say, or for a trailer because there's sort of specific um, time constraints and, and sort of uh, I don't want to say formula but a specific structure that's kind of expected. Like there are certain things in a trail like you want to compose a trailer track that's about two minutes and thirty seconds because that's generally what they allow for a teaser trailer, and editors like to have these like breaks in the song and you want to have it in a three act structure um, you know it's all stuff I'm happy to talk more about and a bunch of articles you can point people to and same for 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 ads on TV like Actually, people want to hear stuff that's let's like talk about okay that. yeah and there's also uh, a bunch of questions I think people sure. yeah, 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 had their hand up for a while talk about that. Yeah, let's take one Sorry. quick question so um, I, I don't know if it's going to be discussed later on but you, you did you discussed some of it in the beginning and um, uh, your your personal successes are all something that I think all of us greatly aspire towards. But um, how exactly do you uh, educate yourself on the business aspect of it, such as finding the opportunities if you don't have your own manager? Mm -hmm. Say you haven't been in a successful band, or you know, I I, I played with band, in bands and then they broke up, and trying to be a musician for a living. <coughs> I've worked, you know, four or five other jobs while trying to do music. How do you find the opportunities? Uh, who do you talk to? You know, um, I, I'm sure we've all heard of, you know, solicited 
methods, you know, where you have actual access and they want to hear your music versus non-solicited, you know, versus where they, they could care less who you are, they'll just take your demo and you'll never hear back from them. How do you find out about some of the opportunities you're talking mm -hmm. about? That's, um, a great, that's a great question because actually mm -hmm. that's the next section that we were going to go into, which was basically just talking about Besides Music Box Licensing, which is, you know, Will's company. Um, so for an aspiring, you know, songwriter who wants to get into licensing, what are the outlets that are available to you? Uh, companies like yours and other larger companies and um, what, and besides your type of companies, mm -hmm. are there other outlets that they can do in, you know, on their own? Like ground floor, like well, right from the beginning. To, to chime in, I would say, there is not an answer for that question, unfortunately. <laughs> you know, it's it's kind of like a, you just have to put yourself out there um, because even, speaking to the solicited versus unsolicited, I have like personal relationships with a lot of record labels and I'll work with a young artist um, uh, that doesn't have a lot of experience but is really talented and I'll personally text the owner of a record label and say, hey, I just recorded this song, it's really good, check it out, and I won't hear back from them. Uh, it's, it's just not the easiest business to be in, um, but commitment is, I think, the most important thing, because if every once in a while you try and you don't get anywhere, you're not going to get anywhere. But if you try a lot and you work really hard, you're, right. your stop. chances at being great are better when you work harder than, you know, just being okay. Um, there, there are a few, um, that, again, there, there are friends of mine that turn me on to them, but the, you all know, you know, Crucial, you know, Crucial Music. Crucial is this, um, the thing that I liked about, there's a friend of mine who um, had some songs placed in some movies and some TV shows. And I asked him about it, and he says, no, it's pretty good. They don't, um, it's not a lot of money, but it's, it's, uh, it's good, you know, when they, when they got it. I so said, like, what kind of good? He said, I don't know, they, they, one thing, I, they split, we split $3,000, and it was a part of a TV show that was on. I said, so these music library companies that kind of started springing up about 15 years ago, uh, a lot, probably 20 years ago, but... Um, crucial, it was remarkable. I kind of, I choose them to send things. They don't charge anything for it. You don't have to, there's no subscription fee. Um, they have a, a high bar for what they work. When they do work something, they, they put it on, I don't know how, what their marketing paradigm is as far as, I think they put a lot of things on discs and they get them out, you know, to, to, production companies that that check in with them that they're looking for this and this and they pass if it's not good they'll tell you why they passed on it that it didn't sound good at the fifth you know the sonically it was not up to snuff it didn't you know or it wasn't uh, this that or the other thing but if it's something that they do work they generally get some sort of activity for it and it's pretty easy you just su submit whatever it is that you want to submit to them. There's another one in um, Colorado called Coop, uh, and a friend of mine turned turned me on to them. And um, and right now, what's interesting, uh, I I have a website. Now there's one tab on my website that says soundtracks, and it's it's odd because the the music that's on there more or less. I think it's exclusively these uh, animated, they're animated sound, uh, to, to soundtracks for animated children's books that uh, went to Scholastic. Uh, and and I had a wonderful time doing, doing music for them, but they're totally unlike anything else that's part of my songwriter world. Um, but I, I realized, gee, this is, I, I've got this 12 minutes of music that's, Continuous. It's really odd to listen to it without the visual because it's a cartoon and it's constantly changing. Like any cartoons that you want to, that you can see, the music is nonstop, and it doesn't stay at the same key signature or tempo or time signature longer than three or four measures because the action is always changing. 
But when you listen to it without the animation, it's just this oddball, it's very musical, but I figured I'd send it out to Coop to, uh, and a, a, again, a friend of mine told me about them, and he said, no, you should send that stuff, I said, because it's just sitting there and I own the music. If you own the music, it is yours. And um, so I heard back from them and they, they, they love it, want to hear more, more like that. I don't know what they're going to do with it or how you, how you, it, it's not, it's not rock, it's very jazzy, whatever it is, but they, um, you sound folks out, you send some stuff and, and they, they're interested, they're interested. Not all of those services uh, charge a subscription. I went with Crucial and I've had a few, a few things placed. Well, yeah, there, because there are some, what's the, there's a big one that's a subscription based and someone told me about yeah. it a long time ago and I, seriously thought about it. it was like I think it was like That's taxi yeah. there it is it's a scam vampiric yeah. it's vampiric like, yeah it's like yeah. 350 bucks a I, year or was, something and they could include you because I, I hear about taxi a lot and I don't understand yeah so I think it just has a flat out rule like I think anything that's pay to play is bullshit steer right. steer away from it right. um, yeah places like taxi you're going to be a needle in a haystack even places where you don't have to pay money to like get the pitches. I mean, because you think about it, you get these things from taxi and it's really alluring. It's like $100,000, we need, you know, something, whatever. And you're like, oh man, I can I can do that. Like, I'm gonna pitch to that. <coughs> but there are thousands of people pitching on it. You they're know, making the, most the, of their money through their subscription. Yeah, they're yeah. making the money through like scamming artists. And you have no agent S looking out for you. Or yeah, looking out yeah. For you. So I'd say anything that's pay to play, I, I mean, in my personal experience, steer, steer clear of that. Um, the other thing, like there are plenty of places where there's no subscription fee, but it's the same problem. You're just a needle in a haystack, and it's like yeah. the odds of you getting discovered um, are very, very low, and then typically the fees are very, very low. So, Audio right. Jungle, Premium Beat, these are sites where you can, I would stay away from. Um, well, you yeah, know, because honestly, even people license stuff for like five bucks. You know, it's um, well that and even but, being like working with you will. He, will will send me a brief of you know someone reached out to him and like Pier One needed uh, three 15 second um, songs for I think it was like Instagram or some some like short form ad and I think it was between me and one maybe two other guys and I yeah. didn't get picked for it so I put in this work and that does I think that's something that should be very much discussed here is there's a lot of work that doesn't get paid. Yeah. But it's not work that goes nowhere because you can use you it to build up it. Right. You I, use it yeah. to build up libraries. Yep. And whatever you discover discovered during the process of doing this thing is like, yeah. oh what this thing worked really well I, for this. Like, right. So those are some things I'd steer clear from. Do you mind if I just respond to some proactive things so you can what, do? What, what, so stay away from those who crucible and um, your, your so, own agent. So I, a few things. One, um, I, I'm huge fan of the following uh, agencies, uh, Maps Music, which is based in Portland, Oregon. It's actually with a guy I work a lot with. He's also very artist-centric. He's the drummer for the band Typhoon. Um, he started, um, yeah, this company, Maps, um, and they're both former Marmoset employees, like executive uh, folks at Marmoset, which is like a one of like the premium, like sort of boutique agencies. Um, like Marmoset did all this stuff for like the Colin Kaepernick like Nike ads. They do stuff for, tons of stuff for like Nike and Google and things like that. Super Bowl ads. The other one is Marmoset Music, which takes both sort of um, like composers who are writing music specifically for media, as well as like artists, you know, who are producing albums that could also be licensed. They're really good. Um, uh, they're also in Portland, Oregon. Uh, music bed is another good one and these I all of these are like really high quality so like you know you obviously have to like pitch your stuff and get accepted into the library but as far as I know I know definitely maps is non exclusive and I'm almost most of marmoset and music bed I think are non exclusive so it's like your hands aren't tied so, so if you just a few more things I want to say before I forget so um, uh, so those are a few agencies I really like that are really artist friendly um, that have really great work and have really deep connections in the industry will do some great like groundwork for you. Um, I would also say like you know to your point about networking before 
Um, if you fall in the camp of, um, I wouldn't recommend this to like an individual like band or somebody who like me can only really kind of like produce music in one style. But if you're like Paul, um, who can like write music in a lot of different styles, you might get some traction getting some face-to-face -face time with um, folks at some of the ad agencies or brands that have in-house agencies in Boston and New York. Boston and New York both have some of the best ad agencies, both for brands and also for New York has a few really good trailer houses. So it's a really, it's a relationships industry. And I've gotten some of the best traction from um, meeting with people face-to-face, -face, getting a coffee, just sort of not doing like a hard sell, but like, hey, like, what are you, like, what kind of music do you look for? And I go with people who, whose work I really admire. But, um, so like, and you can find all that stuff online, like Mullen Lowe is a big one in, 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 Boss, in Boston, big trailer agency in New York is called Geronimo, HBO's headquartered there, they do some great promo work. And then the last thing I'll say is as far as networking, if you're not interested in ads, um, you can get a lot of, um, and if you're say you're more interested in doing film stuff, um, I would definitely check out the Berkshire Film and Media Collaborative, which is local, and they have lots of meetups around here. Um, and there are a bunch of filmmakers who are, I'm sure, looking for great composers for Berkshire Film and Media Collaborative. Um, and also, if you want to just sort of like get your foot in the door with some ad, ad stuff, there is an ad club here in Western Mass, the Ad Club of Western Mass and in Boston. Um, and last thing I'll say, um, so I'm not taking up too much time, as far as things to steer clear from, um, a lot of libraries, um, and there's one, one exception to this, a lot of libraries um, like to have exclusivity for music. So they can say, we're the only place where you can get this music. And unless you have a really strong, uh, uh, two things. One, unless they pay you an upfront fee, like, hey, you give us exclusivity of your songs, we'll give you five grand for a year, and we're gonna pitch the shit out of this, and we're gonna get you lots of money, and then we're gonna get lots of money. Unless there's an upfront fee, um, with a specific time frame, you have exclusivity <coughs> for one year, never sign away, I would never sign away anything exclusivity in perpetuity, which just means forever and ever and ever. Where music goes to die. Where music goes to die. So unless they give you an upfront fee, considerable upfront fee to have exclusivity, or unless um, like it's a really small agency and you just really feel like they're gonna really work hard to pitch your stuff. Now the only ex uh, sort of exception to that is in the trailer world because it's way smaller and way more insular than the brand world. It's pretty, it's, it, it's almost impossible to find like a trailer music house that doesn't ask for exclusivity because otherwise all the music would be in all the shops and you know nobody would have any sort of like unique thing to offer. Could talk more about that, but um, yeah. Does that answer? Yeah. So, um, so, so people can obviously contact these agencies you can contact directly as well to some of the other players you were talking about. So if somebody does make a, you know, an initial contact, how would you, what would you guys think would be the best way to, you know, make a good first impression and to sort of get your foot in the door and, and try and, and, you know, move in that direction? I guess from my experience to have have work that you can show them because that's what they're interested in. Yeah, the very very first question I get from anyone I try to work with, whether it be in the licensing world or in the um, producing well, let's, world. Let's take, is let's take kind of like step by step. Like, what would you first do? Like, you know, let's say you were calling somebody new that you haven't called before. I, I don't know. Say, if you're reaching out to well, someone who makes a short film or something, I guess. I, I can't speak for reaching out to these companies because I haven't done that personally. Um, we just got a beer. Yeah, yeah. Chuck we shit. went to a bar and, and <laughs> talked, and uh, there was that. But th there's that <laughs> version of doing it, and and he was very helpful again because that was, you know, pretty early on in my experience in the licensing world. And how did and how did you get in touch with? It's Will a funny. It was a weird story. Really weird, like link of people. <laughs> I. Knew, know a guy in Chicago that I played in a band with years ago that now is like some big shot at an ad agency in Chicago um, and he linked me up with the I don't even know his title the guy that was He's a, a music supervisor music su well it was a different guy first oh and okay. then he put me in touch with Steven was that him? yeah um, that new will so it's just like this weird 
And the weirdest thing about it was like Alan reached out to me and I don't know how it happened. Like maybe you, I gave you my phone number and you mm-hmm. called and I was like, oh, I recognize that area. What? what? Yeah. And then we found out that like, you know, I, cause I work with like artists like literally all, all over the world or all around the country. And then it's like, in the first five minutes we're like, wait, you live in West Brookfield? I live in Belchertown, like that's, let's get a beer. Yeah. You so know, we, like we it just was, like it took somebody in Chicago to uh, connect two guys living in Western Mass yeah. to, you know. So. Yeah, and uh, that's I guess from cool. there, <laughs> his, um, his advice to me was get a portfolio together. And anyone I've reached to reached out to since then and I say, hey, I love your work. Or, or I guess if this is you reaching out to a like-minded artist, whether it be um, someone who makes uh, short films or something like that, like if you're doing the Kickstarter Vimeo thing, you reach out and you show your passion involved in what you do because you're probably like-minded artists that you're both passionate about what you do and you express that you want to be able to apply what you're passionate about to what they're passionate about. And the first thing they're going to say is, that sounds great. Can I see examples of your work? Uh, and if you don't have that, then they're most likely not going to just take your word for it that you're any good. Um, that's been my experience anyway. And at first you do struggle with that because the first answer is, well, no, I don't really have any examples, but I swear I'll do a good job. Can I ask uh, a related question there? Yeah. Because this is a lot like the demo process when you're trying to get a record deal, but uh, are you showing masters? I mean, how often, was kind of a multiple layered question, but um, how often are they look? Are, are, are you looking for the exact recording that's going to be in the ad, or are they going to take that and re-record that? You know, and along with that, what the, qu- the quality of the demo, mm-hmm. so the quality of the that you're going to be playing? Is it a guitar vocal? You know, is it a piano vocal, or is this stuff? Should you should you have produced? Uh, piece, uh, ex- expect to have produced pieces of work that that runs into a cost. I, I would assume it would be, yeah, the highest quality product because in different aspects of music, like myself as a producer and a songwriter. I can hear a demo that's recorded on an iPhone of a vocal and a guitar and be able to picture what a full production would be. And I can hear the song through the recording. But someone involved in ads or uh, music placement, yeah, I think they kind of want to see examples of what would be in their commercial and or what would be in taking their. That and using that as their bed. Or well, that's what say, that's. They generally record. You you can speak more for this, but that's kind of the library world, which I do not have a very large library. I mostly do, uh, like when um, Will and I work together, it's custom work. He's there's a brief that says, so and so needs a song like this, and he doesn't know of someone's library. Libraries are basically, yeah, you have a ton of music written, whether it be you know, 30 second clips, minute long clips, full songs, things that you've written that you can have really well organized like Will was describing so that if someone, some brand reaches out and says, I need a happy but kind of slow feeling song to um, this video that you might not ever see the video of what they're describing, what you need to write music for. Um, But yeah. So there's the custom version, which, yeah, they won't hear it until it's finished. Or in the library version, which is kind of what you're describing, is they're going to sift through the music you've done, and they say, that one, I want that one. And they use that, right? I have a question for, for, for either of you guys. How much of, do you, how, how many times do you encounter folks that say, this is great, but it's, it's just needs a tweak here and here and oh, because yeah, these the days tweaks. Yeah, I experience it all the time. It was this all the time, and and in that way, it's it's kind of the the whole demo to master thing is transcended because everything is multi-track in in each studio, and it's uh, you know it's a to, to Pro answer, Tools project. And yeah, you can open it up and do whatever it is that they want. Mm-hmm. Make yeah. it soft, make it higher, make it lower, make yeah, it faster, yeah. make it slower. But I guess to answer the question 
the most directly is to have the best possible version of your music which best what people should hear. Yeah. Yeah, I think the production value is like paramount. Um, and then, uh, yeah, but even if the production value is paramount, um, they're always going to ask for tweaks. I yeah. mean, we went through what, like six, seven revisions on, on the come for, together for thing. like a, a cover of a song. So it wasn't for even an like ad. imagine it wasn't an ad for an ad. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like ad people love to, pretty... to justify their jobs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, versus like your if you know like the song structure is there, the style like we knew what the style was. Yeah, you can't really. You know, it's like they still went through like really six or seven different versions of it, little tweaks, versus like, you know, like coming up with something out of thin air. Like, you want something happy, okay, like that's like even more. And that's a whole like different vision. Because they're part of the creative process. Yeah, they, I mean, because the, the other thing, this is like a huge part of what I do and what other music agencies do is like, you know, we try to bridge the world between like film production people and like copywriters and creative directors in the music world because. You know, unless an agency has a music supervisor, which is pretty few and far between, somebody like really speaks the language of music and that's a dedicated job, you generally get like very vague sort of direction. So like part of my job, huge part of my job is developing like really clear creative briefs. You know, especially the custom. It's like translating it, asking a ton of questions, finding um, reference tracks like, oh, when you say happy, you mean like this song, not like not that song. You know, and like really breaking it down to the core parts, but um, I don't know. Yeah, it's it's one of the I guess it's one of the frustrating things somebody to be aware of in the ad world that it's uh, a lot of um, a lot of back and forth and a lot of revision and a, a lot of potential miscommunication because, like you were saying, not everyone like knows music lingo as much as someone that's writing music and what you're describing. You might you really communicate. You might interpret it and. Comp Entirely different way. And I've definitely run across that um, where someone will give me a direction and I'll take it and what I think that direction is, and someone else's song gets chosen. But then I have what I worked on to add to my music library so it doesn't go to waste. Feels like it does right away when you get turned down, but um, it doesn't. One thing that I, I would just add from my perspective and for beginners, term of band people and writers in terms of beginning a Portfolios always walk away from your session with a with a with a track without the vocals because right there if you go in and do a CD and you've got 12 songs and you know you've got the 12 songs but then you've also if you pull a vocal off those songs you've got 12 pieces of instrumental music and that's it's so and much so easier these days than in the old days. Yeah. My first indie film deal was just was done with a yeah. led to a song that I recorded without the vocal. And, and print those stems like. Alan was saying, or have the project file on the hand, so when somebody does want to, like, really play with the mix, take yeah. the bass out, take the drums out, Every step play with the levels, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's, uh, that's just, yeah, yeah. That was any version. Yeah. Well, yeah. What, what is the very specifically? Yeah. It's like an individual, individual track in a song. So you've got a song with drums, bass, and guitar. Okay. You have a drum track that's totally isolated. Yeah, like it's your the track. It's the, the audio. Recording, the recorded track. track. Yeah. So oh, it's you, a live recorded track that you're talking about. Well, it doesn't have to be a live instrument. No. It could it's be it could be a sample. It could be a sample, but it's the audio. As the stems would be. Okay, so it doesn't really matter that much like if you if you sent me a uh, no. if you sent me a, a song and said I'd I'd like to play piano on this or put an organ yeah. on this and I listen to it and think, okay, this is going on, this is going on, I would ask you if you could put all the drums on two tracks, stereo, stereo drums, uh, put a bass on its own track so I can make sure that's not, I can basically do my own little mix of stem. I don't know what, what, what literally well, stem is from. it doesn't necessarily from. have to be one instrument. Stem is a yeah, kind of fun. umbrella term for um, individually bounced sections. So you Some can have an instrumental stem, and so it's all of the music on one track and then a vocal stem and that's all the vocals and it could be it could be the lead vocal and background vocals and um, oohs and ahs and all these bells and whistles that are that are all under the vocal stem um, and you can have a percussion stem which it could include drums I guess it's a complicated answer to the question but stems are individual um, not individual, yeah, individual pieces of audio that are sections of the music, not necessarily 
individual instruments. And if you're if you're mixing something that you you're going to submit for any to any of these companies for any of these potential usages, when the thing is up, when you're sounding the way that it sounds as a song or a track with everything there, while it's up, do a track that's just the drums. Do a, st a stereo track that's just the drums. Do a stereo track that's just the vocals. Do a stereo track of the whole track without the vocals. As many combinations as you can think of to have that in all of the all of the mixing considerations that you've applied to all of the tracks together, folks can have their uh, options open to try it uh, in different and publishers guess, like to do that because they, they want their whatever artist that they right. submitted for to be able to sing along with the track perhaps. And yeah, and I, I guess to be so. clear about like what a track is in that mm -hmm. scenario, not that it, like, I don't know how familiar everyone is with recorded music, but uh, like, a track not being a track in a session, like you don't like a bounced track, meaning a track that you could have on your iTunes or something that is just the stereo version sure. of whatever particular piece of the music. Different versions of the mix. Yeah, basically. Let's talk for a minute about money. Uh, so we've thrown around a couple of figures. You know, I think you guys mentioned briefly, but you know, people would like to know what can they make in, in these various different uh, aspects of licensing, and and how how do you get paid? Who pays who? Um, well, I was going to chime in before when someone in the back was asking, just like, what do you make? Well, Will kind of said that there's a kind of infinite range of what you could potentially make, but. Uh, because I wish in the different in the different you know areas maybe we can break them right. Down. Well, I was going to commercials and I was going to say know, a specific film. situation that I had because I think that would have been valuable information for me to know. It's like okay, you get this one job, play that through to the end. How? What did you do? What did you get? Um, and there was that um, Chilean company. I, I don't even remember <laughs> what it was, but they wanted this cover of Come Together, and Will came to me and said. This company wants this. Here's how they want it. He gave me a um, their references of versions of the song that they liked. That wasn't the Beatles version. This one specifically was a Gary Clark version of this song, which was like a more rock bluesy kind of hi-fi version of the song. That was their reference. They want something like that. They can't necessarily come up with the money to get the rights to that specific version. And their budget, their math, their math yeah, exactly. Right. So I think the budget for that was seven thousand um, dollars. And that one was partly because they blew like, ton, like the whole budget went to Yoko Ono for the, for the you know for the actual song. So they spent like <laughs> probably I don't know how much, but a lot of money for that. And so they have just a small amount. And that's one of the reasons why they do that sort of thing is they can because we've talked about before there are two sides to a song: the writers and the publisher. And so they don't have to pay the publisher, but they have to pay the writer's share on it. Um, so they spend a ton of money, you know, to Yoko Ono or whatever for that song, and then you know we get a much smaller piece of the pie. I'd say it wasn't like a, but it wasn't a terrible fee because no, because that's like you think about the scope really of the work. It's like okay, we don't have to like really come up with new ideas. We just it's kind of just like produ it's just production. Yeah, yeah. And with some tweaking, but the other thing is like it's. Um, uh, it was a, a lower than usual fee, partly because they spent all their money on the the, the original ver like getting the rights to play that song and to air it. But the other thing is that um, you know the fees in other countries, uh, by and large, are a lot lower. Um, so if it was if it was for a U.S. ad agency, the fee probably would have been a lot more. But I, I would assume that, or I guess I can't assume, but anyone in this room probably wouldn't think that $7,000 is a low fee to do something like that. Because to me, like, I mean, any money to be made yeah, making I'm not, music is... I, I'm, I'm not pay. discounting that at all. I mean, the first uh, time I got paid to, to work on it, it was for an indie film. Like, it's like, first of all, like, I was like, wait, I'm going to get paid for this. And I, when I calculated how much, uh, I could pay like $2,000 to score this indie film. And um, I was like shocked. But, you know, when I, if I actually calculate how much time I put into it, it was like, well below minimum wage or whatever, but I was just excited to get paid. 
Um, <laughs> but how, uh, how, do you, how do you negotiate the amount you get paid? I mean, do you need to have a lawyer with you? you know, on that? So I think there are a few things to say. So like, um, I'll say a few things. And I want to. I saw your hand up, and I think there might be a few more people. I, um, but uh, so a few things. Like, there's no set price point. It's kind of the wild, wild west as far as. Like I said, like I've done some pro bono, I've done stuff up to $100,000, and it goes up even more than that. And it really, um, you know, the, you know, people can certainly lowball you. Um, brands can be cheap. Advertising agencies can be cheap or whatever. Um, so it can be really hard to like. First of all, what I, I like to, because the the budgets can be all over the place for a variety of factors. But um, a few things I wrote, I wrote some of this stuff down. Um, uh, I always try and have, and I've heard other people in the industry mention this as well from three successful companies, have them put out the first number, right? Because um, at least for my mind, like I, I start lower, you know, it's just for whatever reason, like I need to like raise the bar a little bit more and just be like, okay, this is a big brand, like they've got money to spend, you know, but have them put out the first number to see sort of like where they're starting. Um, and if you're trying to figure out like what is a fair price for this? Um, it comes down to the usage um, and who the end client is. So things that really determine the, the price of a track is um, like how long they're gonna use it. So if you're doing a license, like it has to be bound by these certain things. Like are they gonna use it in perpetuity, which is just legalese for forever and ever? Are they going to, is it gonna be on TV? If it's on TV, then that's like way more money than if it's just gonna be on the web, generally speaking. Um, so like what's the outlet? Is it radio? Is it TV? If it's TV, is it just regional versus national? Um, is it, are they just playing it for a week or are they playing it for a year? How many markets? Um, how many markets? Those are all things. And when you're just starting, what I did when I was just starting out was um, I went on to places like Marmoset and the Music Bed and they, for smaller projects, um, I, I don't know exactly what the cutoff is, but like they determine their licensing based on the usage and terms and the size of the end client. So say you're a producer and you want to get a track from the music bed or Marmoset. You find a track that you love and you want to buy that license. If you're buying it for a nonprofit, you know, with like 10 people on staff, maybe it's like $100. If you're buying it for a company with 100 employees and it's just going to be on the web, um, then it's going to be whatever, like $2,000 or what, whatever it is. And that can be a really good um, like starting place. Like, what are other places charging? Don't go to Audio Jungle or Premium B because they're charged like nothing. Um, but you know, go to a place like Marmoset and Music Bay. Like, what would these companies who have been around for a long time? What are they charging? The only tricky thing is once you get up to a certain level, like once you like say you're contacted by a big company <coughs> or a big ad agency as for a big TV spot. Marmoset and Music Bed won't put out their numbers for that. That's all sort of like custom quotes. You know, they want to keep that stuff private. They want to be able to have the negotiating <laughs> power to go up or down. But Marmoset and Music Bed are good for some of those smaller projects to see like what are other places um, charging. Um, I, I don't know where I am now. When you were talking but, about the, the come together uh, thing, would that not suggest that they have kind of deep pockets to get the rights to that song in the first place? Yeah, I guess so. And Honestly, in my experience, and maybe I'm just doing it all wrong, but there hasn't been an opportunity to negotiate. <laughs> uh, it's kind of like, here's the budget, here's what we have, yeah. are you able to do it? Um, I think the negotiating factor would probably come in to the independent world, like the cold call version where you're reaching out to artists or, or filmmakers or things that you like and you, that. They want to know what you're. They want to, yeah, yeah. That's charge. that's where the, I guess, negotiating would come in in, in the versions that I've done, um, but yeah, in that in that come together version, it was kind of just like, here's a budget. Can you do it? I have a recording studio, mm -hmm. um, and when I'm not on tour, I have kind of a pretty open schedule. I can make anything work. Um, so I did it and. Then that went from there to having a couple Skype calls with the music director at the company, right? That's who it was. Mm -hmm. um, and giving me a little bit of direction on my first version. I had to revise it. Um, and I think we did that twice. And yeah. yeah. And then 
I, yeah, I would just say like the biggest things because it could be really and even to this day there are times where like I have no idea what charge for this. So I'm gonna call my friend Alex at Maps who worked on even way, way bigger projects at Marmoset and be like, so here are the terms. Here's like the size of the client. <laughs> Um, cause obviously you're gonna charge more for Google than like a small nonprofit. Um, and you know, he can give me his perspective like what well, Marmoset, we would have charged this or like this range is generally what it is. Um, you start high and then you like, you know, go to a good meeting place generally in the middle. Um, but, uh, always try and get the client to put the number first. If you're working with a music agency, they'll do all the negotiating. We'll have a good idea of like what a fair number is. Um, and then, you know, ask for help for people who have been around. I still do it to this day. I still call on Alex a lot to see, like, if I'm not sure about a, a price for something. And any one of you in here could, um, if you're faced with that situation, you're not sure what to charge, you know, email me. Um, and I'd be happy to, you know, like, tell you what I think would be a fair price or somebody I know who would know more about that. Um, but, yeah, just ask because it can be really confusing because it's not like you're buying a widget that costs X amount of dollars. It's really subjective and anyways you had a question yeah um it seems to me what i'm hearing is that there's kind of uh, um two tracks one is that you're you can be a producer composer um songwriter and able to do work on you know someone requests uh, a, a specific thing for a specific project mm -hmm. or say trailers or that kind of thing and then there's also those of us myself who are songwriters and might have you know a whole um uh, portfolio of songs mm -hmm. and um, I am one, and, uh, and that's for myself personally, I'm not, um, I write music, but I'm not, I wouldn't say that I'm a producer composer at the moment, um, but I do have all this material. So I'm wondering if the same, it, it seems like um, the elusive question is here is how do you make the connections for the right stuff? Well, and what would you recommend to somebody who has, you know, you know 30 produced songs? Um, by songwriter, what do you mean? Because oh, there's so many versions right, of a songwriter. Right, there's lyricists, there's guitar singers, there's right. piano players that don't right. sing. So in my case, I mean, I'm an independent um, singer-songwriter and I have, okay. you know, several records and, mm -hmm. and they're, you know, they're all professionally produced and arranged and all that stuff, you know, really yep. good quality music. Um, uh, what would you do with something like that if that is your, the majority of what your portfolio is? Will might be able to answer that better than me. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think um, linking up with a good um, agent, uh, company or agency, typically, like, I feel like folks in your position can get a lot of traction out of placements in shows um, and on, in, in films and stuff because, like, writing for ads is, like, a really sort of specific thing um, that sometimes, but usually not always, um, stuff that was just written as its own song doesn't always have, like, it's it's a much lower chance of landing than somebody who's like writing stuff specifically for commercials for example but i feel like there's the doors are way more wide open to get placements in shows and so there are specific um like music companies the like production music library well i would actually production music library and there are a ton of them and i would actually if you email me i'd be happy to connect you with paul amos so i i try to get on this panel but we couldn't um but he's Nathan like that's, make it today. that's some of you might know him as angry johnny yeah, he's in, yeah, um, but uh, he works with a bunch of uh, music companies out in LA. That that's their specialty is they just do like in show placements for songs, um, and the the money making part of that is a little bit different, um, where it's not like little to no upfront fee. It's all royalties, yeah. getting on the back end. But um, for whatever reason, like it's just, you know, you can play it in the background more. There's just so much more content, like time-wise, to fill up with music that, you know, and I obviously it would be di very different conversation if like like actually hearing your music probably give me more of an idea, but my, my general sort of feedback sometimes for folks in that position is um, think about maybe not so much ads. That could be in one way, but also think about like placement and shows. And they're, they're and I just don't have the, the the relationships with those companies to know, like Ep Epidemic Sound is one out in LA. Um, Marmoset and Musicbed both mostly focus on ads. Oh, so like, okay. yeah, so like the music companies, they tend to have like, it's it's like so segmented, like there are trailer music companies and then there's commercial music companies and then there's production music companies and then companies do placements of like songs in 
um, in shows and stuff. So you have to find the right company in that niche. Do you know somebody who would, are you saying that Paul might be a person to talk to? About? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. And having, definitely having stems yeah. would be important That's because because there's, uh, there's definitely a scenario where someone might hear one of your songs and say like, this is the perfect song for like the energy that this song gives is the perfect song for this one part in the short film that I wrote. But the lyrical content doesn't match what's happening. But I love the energy and the, and the, and the emotion that's in the guitar or something like that. So having that uh, available is really important. So I wanted to mention uh, Steven Schoenberg, who I told you couldn't make it today. He's, um, he's had lots of experience. Uh, uh, licensing music, he licensed a lot of music for Sesame Street, um, and so the one thing I was able to get him in between costs to say today, and I asked him, I said, if there's one thing you'd like me to be able to say, you know, that you would have liked to have talked about, what he said is, um, and Will, I would really like your um, input on this too, is um, in particular because you're, you know, you're dealing with the artist directly. Uh, he said to try to make sure that you retain ownership of your music. Because he said a lot of these companies are not, you know, they're, they're just going to be right off the base, assuming that they're going to have ownership of it. And he said, but if you have a good, he said he's, his experience has been that he has, he usually uses a lawyer, but he said that he's been able to to retain ownership or sometimes cut a deal where he'll, he'll retain 75% ownership, 50% ownership. Um, it's pretty It's pretty typical, depending on who you're working with. I mean, we don't take any like publishing or anything like that, but typical enough, you know, for companies to take the publisher's side of things, but never sign away your writers, I, I believe, unless you're doing like a work for hire. So yeah, definitely retain ownership, and that kind of goes to the exclusivity part of it. Like when you when you're tied into something exclusive, unless you know they're really gonna push push your work, you know, like keep it keep your options open. But um, yeah. yeah, and because to speak on my experience with the exclusivity version, like I'm not sure if everyone's familiar exactly. Like all these companies are basically like like um, Will's company is kind of a middleman between you and the, this. Okay this ad agency that you wouldn't be able to get in contact otherwise. But someone like Will, who's non-exclusive, you can share your library with him and all these other companies that are non-exclusive. So you basically have your music available to more people that one ad, ad agency might not have reached out to Will, but they might have reached out to Marmoset for something. And your chances at doing that are greater but then there are music houses like that that are exclusive where they are the only ones that can have your music. And like Will said, what, what's the point of that, really? Can we get to more questions? Okay. Yeah. So Maybe folks you haven't asked yet. Um, <coughs> I, missed, I might have missed like intros because I was a little late. So sorry if you're asking me to repeat yourself. Sorry. But um, are, you are you all local and and have you lived in like New York or LA or Nashville or anything? And, and like, had can you speak to just like, like maintaining Regional. momentum, like stay, like generating work without living in a place mm -hmm. that where there's where you're like networking just like in your day to day life. The internet definitely makes it easier. We're yeah, we're all you're local: Belchtown, West Brookfield, East Hampton. East Hampton. Um, and we're actually like really one of the reasons why I focus on ads is just because like you know I live in Western Mass and so it's relatively easy to hop on the Amtrak um, or on the Pike and go um, have lots of face-to-face -face time with ad agencies and brands um, as opposed to like I would kind of rather be in sort of like making music for shows and for movies and stuff but you have to be have to be in LA. You don't have to be, but you have a better chance of like networking and all that stuff. So they're some of the best ad agencies and some of the you know biggest brands are in New York and Boston. So it's yeah, I take lots of day trips out there and do these presentations to companies and take people out to coffee and stuff like that. So I think Western Mass is actually a really great spot to be um, for partly for that reason. So and I I guess I have a little bit of an advantage because I do a lot of traveling. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a, touring musician most mostly 
Um, so I do a lot of traveling. Tra a lot of traveling. I do spend time in LA, in New York, in Chicago. Um, so I do meet with people when I happen to be in the area, which is very convenient, uh, but not always doable. But I found that you could, you can definitely get what you need to get done remotely, mm -hmm. um, especially if you do have the opportunity to make some face-to-face -face time so that, it's yeah. a, so that it's a real relationship. Like I've always felt even a phone call is like infinitely better than an email. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Because when you make a personal connection with someone, it, there's just, there's so much more reality behind like, oh, there's a person there. It's not just like an email with some words that I'll probably ignore and forget about. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else have a question? Yeah. Um, this might be a little off scope, but if so, maybe I can talk to someone after. But I'm wondering about, so I'm sort of in Carrie's position, you know, I'm a singer, songwriter, I have recordings, but, you know. Um, and I've been trying to wrap my head around like the publishing thing. So, like, can we talk about. Me too. <laughs> okay, that makes me feel better. Like, like music publishing versus licensing, or you know, or what's the deal? Honestly, it, it's a nightmare. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I've I've been a again a professional musician. Like it's been my career for um, over a decade now, and I do make money from publishing. Uh, I make royalties, and I still I have no idea how. I honestly. If well, it, yeah, publish, publishing. I do. I do have a manager and a business manager and a record label and a booking agent. And I have all these people that kind of do a lot of stuff. That's great. You don't need problems. Which is, which is, <laughs> um, but publishing is like just something that is almost an entirely different language um, to me, anyway. Are you a licensed? Uh, are you with ASCAP or BMI or CSAC? No, I'm just like an independent person. Mm -hmm. It's it's music. very easy to. <clears throat> it's not a bad. Thing to 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 do um, to have a a <coughs> PRO performing performance rights organization performance rights organization ASCAP BMI uh, you you register you can register your songs um, and if somewhat something were to happen with that that song they're looking out for your your royalties. These days, you got to sort of check up on that stuff more. These days, well, there's, because there's something so called I, I can't fully explain exactly what it mm -hmm. is, but this is what people have described to me, and it sounds amazing. Is this thing called Sound Exchange? It's great. Yeah. Sound Exchange. I've made more money with Sound Exchange than than publishing royalties. Yeah, it's basically yeah. ten years of a, a, a thing that has money waiting for you if you have music out in the world that has been used. So music that you've performed or written. It's very masters oriented. Right. <clears throat> it's masters based as opposed to intellectually intellectual rights song writer based. Yeah. But it's great. they they were the first people I know the, the fellow who started that company and um, they had the right idea. They saw early on. Yeah. Wait a minute, everything's digital. It's pretty if you had the right Stuff you can pull it, you can find out who's playing it where anyway you know and the, um, so they're they're good but to to have your you, you as a songwriter that, that as the writer of your song it isn't always the case anymore but it should be and I think it's it's up to the songwriters really to stand up and to say my fifty percent of this song is sacrosanct mm -hmm. nobody's getting that. I don't care who it is. There's there's exceptions. There's hey, you know, um, I'd like to sing this demo for you. I think you know, uh, if you give me a piece of the song, <laughs> you know, there have been cases. And but that is your song. That, that 50 percent. The other 50 percent, you publish. You, you know, that's your public. That's the, the half. That's the publisher. Or anything that they want to do. Any any license that they procure for it, they're going to split with you as per your agreement with them, which is usually 50-50. Okay. If you have a couple of hits, it can be 70-30, you know, whatever. Uh, 
It, it is really confusing. I just want to add one thing. It is super confusing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and two resources I want to put out there. One, there's a book. I'm trying to look it up on my phone, but I don't have internet. But it's by Donald Passman. It's like every, everything, everything you want to know about the music business. It's a great book. It's, it sounds it's like yeah, it's really, really good. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but Donald Passman, everything you want to know about the music business, that's great. And then like if you're like further along and you really need somebody to, I mean like I've, I've certainly had you know, whenever things get like really confusing, especially like looking at contracts or whatever, I run it by uh, Leah Kunkel, who's a great just local, about to ask about her. Great, great, great local attorney who specializes in music licensing. Her yeah. her office is in the old K U N K E L. Yeah. And what's her first name? Leah. Um, Russell, Russell's ex wife. <laughs> I talked to him yesterday. Yeah, she's in the um, where the Northampton Center for the Arts used to be next to the Academy of Music, and um, she's really cool. She actually was like a singer-songwriter like in the 60s, like totally gets it, um, but is also like this badass lawyer who like can demystify legalese and stuff. I know that's not really the publishing side of things, but this world can get pretty confusing, so like having that, um, anyways. If you need a lawyer to look at any, any contract that has to do with this business, someone like Leo, don't get a lawyer, because I think that all lawyers know all of the arcane aspects of the music business, they don't get a music yeah. business lawyer. There's a question over there. I did have a question. Um, the term 50-50 split has been thrown around a lot, but also so things like work for hire. How is it trending? Is it more work for hire? You guys are seeing because of a lot of industries like publishing and uh, excuse me, content marketing, it's really about holding things out right. Is that something that you're seeing? Yeah, so um, what I'm seeing, so the work for hire and 50-50, um, 50-50 is pretty much here to stay, I hope. Um, the work for hire part is more in terms of um, uh, like just not paying out royalties. So like in the ad world, it's definitely trending towards like we're going to pay you a much larger upfront fee so we don't have to deal with royalties and so residuals buyout. and things like that. So it's a, they would call it a buyout, sometimes a work for hire, like what Alan and I did, where it's just sort of this one-off job. Well, but and that's, and that's, that's definitely where it's trending. It's not, for the ad world, it's not um, And in that scenario, they're both, they're used together. Like uh, the work for hire is being split 50-50. Uh, it's, yeah. it's, not, it's not one yeah. or the other. It's a uh, Like it, with Will and I, it was the ad agency Yes, yeah, between had us. had a budget, and then yep. because he facilitated the work, he gets 50%. Because I created the work, I get 50%. Got it. Well, there's one thing that I, I uh, told you we would talk later about, so I want to make sure you at least get a chance to say something about it, which you talked about that there's a particular structure that, um, that they look for when um, if you're going to be composing a, uh, tra a trailer mm -hmm. versus, let's say, a, a two and a half minute, you mentioned two and a mm -hmm. half minute trailer versus a two and a half minute commercial. So what would be the yeah. structure? Yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot of resources out there, and I've got cards, email me. I love talking shop about this stuff, and I can send you resources. But like, in a nutshell, like a trailer, if you're writing a trailer track, um, they want it to be two and a half minutes long, because that's typically how long a teaser trailer is, like when they first announce the the movie and it comes out on YouTube or whatever, it's generally two and a half minutes long. And that trailer track should follow a three to four act structure, um, which is just sort of a story, like storytelling structure where there's like, there's big builds and, you know, beginning, big drops, big, beginning, middle and ends. Um, and typically those, if you like divide up the two and a half minutes and um, whatever, like each act is like 40 seconds long, like 35 to 40 seconds long. And you want to have like big drops in there to add drama, but also so that editors can cut to it. So that's like very, very like basic sort of like how you'd want to do a trailer track. But um, for for something in a commercial space, whether it's taking something you've already recorded and like doing a cut down version, so like you've got your two and a half minute track, but you think it might work well for an ad, like you go back into Logic or whatever and you make like a 30 second version. Um, a 60 second version and a 15 second version. Those are typically like, those are the slots that advertisers buy on TV, 15, 30, and 60. Um, so having things that ideally aren't just fade outs, fade outs are okay, they can work, but if you can um, make it so it has what they call a sting ending, so it like ends, like it really truly ends on a 30 second mark, 
that's going to be a lot more, typically a lot more sort of appealing to somebody than if they have to listen to a two and a half minute track and then they have to figure out how am I going to fit this into 30 seconds. Right. And the last thing I'll say is for like commercial stuff, even in 15 second things like the Pure One stuff we were working on was 15 seconds, it still has to have some storytelling to it, generally. It's got to have an arc. It's got to have an arc. To it. It's got to move. So one of the things that's hard about like retrofitting a pre-recorded song, like a two and a half minute song, to an ad is that it takes a lot longer to build and develop, right? A lot can versus, happen in 15 seconds. Versus so like, much more than you think. Versus like, we've got a 15 second spot and we need to have this feeling in the beginning and this feeling in the end, so it's really got to move. Right. It's good to know if and, they, they can tell you that. Yeah. yeah, and then that scenario, when I got the brief, it was very, very well described what they wanted within the 15 seconds, what kind of energy. There were some examples. I think that was your facilitating. The, the, like the ad agency didn't say, like, I want it like this song or this song, but you took their interpretation yeah, super vague. and sent me versions of what you thought they were talking about. So I had some references. Yeah. Um, so if you've got a three and a half minute song and you want to pitch it as a 15 second or 30 second or whatever, it's not choosing the best excerpt of that and having that be yeah the work you even edit it to, together to, be, to work on its own terms yeah. as a 15 30 second piece. There's an art beginning and a middle sure. and an end. Yeah, three act structure goes. Three act structure is the best religion in the. In the universe. What were the three numbers? You said there were three numbers. There's 30, 15, and 60. 60. 60, yeah. All right, well, our time is running out. Uh, is there anybody who has one very short question, maybe? I'm just wondering if there's any, or you have any experience with like local advertising? I feel like the quality tends to be like a little bit lower, it might be easier for like front end, like ground floor getting into it, but I don't know like who, who's making mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Like how do you contact those kind of people? Yeah, so I, I, I always wanted, you know, to do stuff locally, um, especially in the beginning, that's sort of where I started. But um, there are some really kick-ass ad agencies in the area, but they're not necessarily producing TV commercials. There's like a great graphic design company out in Hadley Brigade and other places like that. But there just aren't a whole lot of them who are like making TV spots or video work. Um, but they are out there. Um, that a great place to start is um, the Ad Club of Western Mass, and seeing who who member because anybody who's involved in that real like ad community around here is a is a member. Um, and there are some. Yeah, and the, the budgets are are um, unfortunately like not there. A lot of buyout. Seen that on <laughs> yeah. the radio. I mean, you can call the local radio station. They'll have people who want to want to put little spots who don't have. It. Yeah, but it might be a good place to um, like hone your chops and and build your portfolio. But you really have to go out to Boston and yeah. New York to find the, play, the people who put the budgets. I want to thank our panel, everybody. Uh, let's give it up. Right. Uh, and, uh, and I will got some business yeah. cards. I, I unfortunately have to run, but um, please okay. email me. Um, yeah. I'd love to chat. And I'll leave a bunch of cards. Uh, if you haven't yet checked out our New Music Alliance website, please do that. Let's and get one of those over try, and, uh, try and uh, become a member or a sponsor. We'd really appreciate it.